It is a little-known phenomenon, but the quality of an early aviation pioneer's moustache goes a long way towards predicting their success or place in history. Why this would be the case, I do not know beyond wild speculation. Personally, I feel that redirected airflow over the hairy caterpillar helps oxygenate the brain and enhances thinking. Alternatively, in the primitive flight conditions prevalent at the time, facial hair helps cushion the skin against the wind, prevents tender parts of the body from freezing, and thus allows the flyer to make observations that would otherwise go unremarked if distracted. However, it's one thing for me to speculate. Let's get to cases. Pictured is Louis Blériot. Just look at that moustache. It's magnificent. Here's a piece of face fungus that makes a statement and clearly says, I belong to someone who's going somewhere. Of course, Blériot did. After extensive building and experimentation, he became the first person to fly across the English Channel in a heavier-than-air craft, and even before the outset of World War I was a successful manufacturer. The Blériot Type 11 became the world's first warplane with its participation in the Italo-Turkish War of 1911-1912, and saw service in World War I as late as 1915 in the Balkans, where it was equipped with weaponry as heavily as a Schwarzlose heavy machine gun. During the war, he acquired the assets of SPAD and went on to further success. Continuing the Blériot theme, there's this guy. You may or may not know who he is, but you can just tell from that moustache that he must have been someone significant. Well, he was! An Italian aviation pioneer of the pre-war period, he is perhaps best known for being the first person to fly a combat mission in an aircraft, specifically a Blériot Type 11. This is Capitano Carlo Maria Piazza, who took the entire Italian aviation division, all nine aircraft, to war in Libya during the Italo-Turkish War. So not only did he fly the world's first combat mission in the world's first warplane, he was the first commanding officer to lead his squadron into combat. His aircraft flew reconnaissance, spotted for artillery, and performed light bombing missions. And if you want my opinion, that's a moustache that clearly makes a statement to that effect. Unfortunately, the potential of his facial hair was never fully realized, and he died of fever in 1917. However, one of Capitano Piazza Sotto Tenentes, that's second lieutenant in English, achieved more during his career, and he breaks the mold by having a full beard. Strangely, I do not find that his facial fuzz makes a statement as profound as those that have gone before, but his place in history is well established. This is Sotto Tenente Julio Gavotti, and his claim to fame is that he was the first man in history to fly a bombing mission, when he dropped grenades out of his aircraft onto Turkish encampments at the Takira Oasis and Ain Zara. His aircraft, the first bomber, was an Etrecht Tauber, and he was part of the Italian Aviation Division, commanded by Carlo Maria Piazza. His actions were the cause of much celebration in the Italian press and worldwide condemnation elsewhere, as bombing from the air violated Article 4, Subsection 1 of the 1899 Hague Convention. The bombing, incidentally, wasn't just some haphazard action either. It was planned in advance. Gavotti went on to a long and quite successful career with the Italian Air Force, rising to the rank of colonel. He then entered civil aviation. So perhaps it is not necessarily the magnificence of the moustache, but the sheer quantity. On a side note, I should mention that Ignaz Ego Etrich himself was possessed by a moustache. Next in the excellence of moustache category, we have this fellow. As with those covered so far, here is a lip covering that clearly makes a statement about its owner. Surely here is a pioneer who is going places. And he did. Mostly upwards. 
You see, this is Paul Cornu, the first man to achieve vertical flight. While not the first to experiment with the helicopter, he was the first to get the concept into the air, and surely that walrus moustache is part and parcel of his success. That he managed to do this in the pre-World War I days of aviation speaks much to his ingenuity, determination, and the cooperation of his lifelong companion, his moustache. Sadly, he was never able to follow up on his success, falling victim to severe disillusionment, and later in life to the shelling of his hometown during an Allied bombardment prior to the opening hours of the D-Day landings. Now, you may well be saying to yourselves, What is this guy on? I can name half a dozen pioneers of early aviation who did not have moustaches. Well, consider these two pictures. On the left, we have the Wright brothers, who possessed a modest moustache between them. Or, putting it another way, half a moustache each. On the right, we have Glenn Curtis, who is in a symbiotic relationship with a rather fine set of whiskers. So I ask you, which of these was the more successful, innovative, and imaginative aviation pioneer? Of course, the answer is obvious. Glenn Curtis. Despite vigorous opposition from the rights, he was able to soldier on, work around the obstacles put in his way by them, and even go so far as to build an aircraft first designed in 1883 in order to demonstrate that the rights had not invented lateral control. He went on to be one of the founders of the USA's early aviation industry, promote flight in the public's imagination in the U.S. to an extent that the Wrights never did, and even bought out the Wrights to form the Curtis Wright Aircraft Company. In short, he surpassed his competition in short order. Given the subject of this video, this should not be a surprise. But how about this guy? He is famously clean-shaven. Surely his contributions to military aviation mark him as being the exception to the rule. Well, this is Anton Fokker. Despite vigorous self-promotion, he is perhaps most famous for stealing anything that wasn't nailed down. His reputation for claiming credit and denying it to others is, if not beyond par, then certainly right up there with the likes of Thomas Edison and Hiram Maxim. The lawsuits he fought over patent infringement, while generally lost on the general public, are something that cannot be overlooked by those in the know. The quality of his aircraft during World War I was notoriously bad, notwithstanding their flying capabilities, and this was something regarding which he clashed with German high command on several occasions. In short, he was not a designer, a poor manager, and despite his alleged close relationships with German pilots, clearly didn't empathize with them. He demonstrated this most notably as his lead designer, Martin Kreutzer, lay mortally wounded in the ruins of a crashed aircraft, and placed priority on angrily berating the poor man as he was dying. Another famously clean-shaven pioneer of early aviation was Raymond Saulnier. He's the one in this picture entirely lacking facial hair. With this gentleman, I struggled to come up with an explanation for his success from the earliest days of aviation until the early 1960s. However, I have come to a realization. Whatever the reason for his lack of facial hair, be it heredity or a poor grooming decision, he made sure to associate extensively with those who did, so that the qualities embodied in a fine moustache could, through osmosis or perhaps some other mechanism, be transferred by association. And his association with bewhiskered aviation pioneers is well established. He worked with Louis Blériot on the Type 11, whose fine facial adornment I have covered previously. He then moved on to the Moraine brothers, Léon and Robert, with whom he established the aircraft manufacturer Moraine Saulnier. It is important to note that both of them had moustaches, and it is therefore no accident that their name comes first in the company that they established with him. 
Finally, and perhaps most notably, there is his relationship with Roland Garro, with whom he worked on a method of firing a machine gun through the propeller arc. And needless to say, Garro was possessed by a fine lip caterpillar. So, while on the face of it, Raymond Saulnier appears to be an exception to the rule, his success can actually be attributed to moustaches, just not his own. I shall end this rather irreverent look at early aviation pioneers and their moustaches with this man. This is Nagaoka Gaishi. And just look at that moustache. At the time, it was the second longest moustache in the world, and you would think that his contributions to early aviation would match. And you would be correct. Though little known in the West, he is regarded as the father of Japanese military aviation. In 1907, a balloon unit was established near Tokyo, followed by the establishment of the Provisional Military Balloon Research Association on the 30th of July 1909, under his leadership. Despite the name of this association, indicating its sole interest to be in lighter-than-air flight, much of its attention was in powered heavier-than-air craft, and it was the only Japanese organization to direct its efforts towards this new means of flight. And in this, they were highly successful. It is perhaps appropriate that such was the respect earned by his moustache during his lifetime it was the recipient of its own grave and interred separately from the body. By now, of course, you will have realized that this video was released on April the 1st. However, while I may have played fast and loose with the importance of the moustache amongst early aviation pioneers, that last comment happens to be quite true. If you've made it this far into the video, hopefully it means you enjoyed the content. If you would like to see more, please click the subscribe button, leave a like, and feel free to join in the conversation in the comments. Questions and suggestions are welcome.